Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I hereby open the work session of the Planning Commission. Could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner McGinley. Present. Commissioner Landon. Present. Commissioner Corvula. Here. Commissioner Gill. Present. Commissioner Bergen. Commissioner Salzar. Present. And, and Commissioner Buck. I'm present. Okay. And Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. As we begin our meeting tonight, I would like to ask members of the audience who are joining us by phone or online to please keep yourselves on mute during this portion of the meeting. This meeting is a work session where the public may attend, but not provide testimony. So we have two work session items tonight. I also will just note for the record that Commissioner Bergen has, is now in attendance. Um, our first work session item is the Main Street Safety Project. Um, so I will first kick that over to the city attorney, Mary Bridget Smith, um, to give a brief statement regarding conflicts of interest. And then afterwards, we will kick it to staff, Mar Molly Markarian. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioner um, Chair McGinley and the Planning Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. I'm here tonight because Christina is out of town and I wanted to address briefly, uh, make a statement about conflicts of interest. Just as a reminder, a conflict of interest is any decision that could or would impact a commissioner's financial interest, the financial interest of their business or the interest of their family member or the family member's business. For the Main Street Safety Project Facility Plan, commissioners can only have a potential conflict of interest. The commission's future recommendation to the city council isn't binding on the council, so it cannot result in an actual conflict of interest. However, commissioners with a potential conflict of interest must disclose the nature of the conflict before they can participate in the work session. So I think the chair um, can go forward and ask you if you have a potential conflict of interest, and then we'll do the same thing again for the second item. Thank you. Um, I'll start off with myself. I have no potential conflicts of interest. Um, Commissioner Landon. No potential conflicts of interest. Commissioner Cuevla. None. Commissioner Salazar. I have no potential conflicts of interest. Commissioner Buck. I have no potential conflicts of interest. Commissioner Gill. I have no potential conflicts of interest. And Commissioner Bergen. I don't remember how I've responded in the past if I had potential conflict of interest or not, um, because I am a real realtor um, and this could affect property values. So potential co conflict of interest, I suppose. Thank you, everyone. And now I will hand it over to Molly Markarian. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I assume you can see it. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off your your faces. And so if if people like raise their hands or anything like that, if someone could let me know, that would be helpful. Good evening, uh, planning commissioners. I'm Molly Markarian, senior planner with the city. And um, as you all um, are, most of you are probably aware. Um, the Main Street Safety Project is a collaborative effort between the City of Springfield and the Oregon Department of Transportation. And so I'm the city's project manager. Um, I also have a counterpart at ODOT, Bill Johnson, who I don't believe has um, joined us yet, um, but he will at some point tonight. Tonight, I'm going to start by bringing you up to speed on the project since we last met in April, um, and then jump into reviewing the draft facility plan with an emphasis on chapter four, which is the uh, toolbox of solutions and chapter five, which talks about implementing the toolbox. Uh, I will also uh, share some common themes in the feedback that we've heard from the community on the draft facility plan, 
and then um, go over tech memo 19, which uh, was in your packet, the recommendations for local policy and ordinance amendments uh, to accompany the draft uh, facility plan. And then we'll move into your questions and feedback and then cover next steps. We always like to start uh, with the purpose statement for this project to help remind us why we're all here. The purpose of the Main Street Safety Project is to select infrastructure solutions that will make Main Street safer for people walking, biking, driving, and taking transit. As a reminder, early in uh, the planning phase, we sought feedback from the community on their priorities uh, for Main Street, which informed our development of goals and objectives, and in turn then informed the evaluation criteria our development of uh, solutions and analysis of those solutions. And then finally, our development of the draft solution toolbox. The Main Street Safety Project is recommending changes to Main Street to help improve safety and address the specific type of crashes that we see on Main Street. We see a high percentage of rear end and turning movement crashes on the corridor, which is common on urban streets with a high number of driveways and intersections like Main Street, but 80% is particularly high. Our data shows that the primary causes of these crashes are failure to yield right of way and following too closely. We've heard questions from the community as to whether or not there are specific areas on the corridor that see more crashes than others. And as you can see from the map on the screen, Crashes occur throughout all of Main Street and thus why we really need a corridor wide solution. Over the past three plus years, our project team has been refining safety solutions based on community input, technical analysis and city council feedback. This past spring, um, the planning commission, the Main Street governance team and the Springfield city council acknowledged community input from our third round of community engagement and confirmed that the toolbox recommendations met their expectations and direction to date, including addressing safety on Main Street, recommending implementation of infrastructure elements with a balanced approach to improve safety and support business and economic development on the corridor and presenting the recommendations with a toolbox approach that is simple, flexible, and can be implemented gradually in phases. At their May 10th work session, the city council directed our project team to proceed with developing a draft facility plan, which we did this summer in collaboration with our technical advisory committee. As we noted in our May 6th e-update, during the third round of community engagement, we heard some misconceptions about what the project is or is not. As you all are well aware, uh, there's a long history of projects on Main Street, and there are many business and property owners who engaged early on in those projects and have not necessarily tracked the evolution of Main Street planning decisions since then. So the rumors that we're working to dispel about the recommended toolbox are addressed in more detail in fact sheet number five, which can be found on the project website at mainstreetsafety.org. And I'm hoping that someone on our project team can maybe pop that into the chat for folks. Moving on to the draft facility plan. If you recall, we've talked about this um, in prior uh, presentations, but just to bring everyone back up to speed, the uh, facility plan pulls together analysis, outreach and design concepts from this planning phase. It's an expression of community values. It designs a framework for project delivery and it signals to ODA and the city to begin detailed design and construction. Upon adoption, it would also refine the Springfield Transportation System Plan. The Draft Main Street Facility Plan is divided into five chapters with a roadmap at the beginning to guide the reader. Chapter one, introduction, includes a history of planning projects on Main Street, the policy context that guided this planning phase, 
a description of the project process and decision-making structure. Uh, it also highlights the levels of community outreach and participation. Chapter two, Main Street Needs, describes existing and future transportation needs on the corridor organized by project goals. It reiterates the serious safety problem that has persisted on Main Street. And it reflects business community characteristics, including a description of the number and types of businesses on the corridor, common site usage and access concerns expressed by businesses, and it summarizes the key findings from our literature review, examining economic impacts from similar projects with raised medians and roundabouts. Chapter three, solutions development and evaluation process describes just that, how we developed the safety solutions and evaluated them, and also describes solutions that we considered but may not have included in the, in the toolbox of solutions. Our toolbox approach is informed by community feedback and a desire for flexibility, simplicity, and phaseability. The primary tools are roundabouts, raised medians, and long-term street cross-section upgrades to enhance safety and comfort of those walking and biking. There's an aspect of each tool that does not promote a one size fits all approach. And I'll note those as we go through each of the tools. We analyzed roundabouts and signals at all major intersections on the corridor. Roundabouts fared better and were more aligned with the community goals. Adjustments that will be made at the time of design tailored to each intersection are an example of how this tool does not fit the category of one size fits all. Another key tool are raised medians as they would uh, be the greatest contributor to improve safety on Main Street. They address major turning conflicts. If you recall from the beginning of the presentation, the primary causes of crashes on Main Street include turning movement crashes. When medians are combined with roundabouts, we would see an even greater crash reduction, closer to 48%. With raised medians, we're taking a balanced safety and access approach that would result in limiting out of direction travel to 30 to 60 seconds on average. This amount of out of direction travel is approximately how long it takes drivers presently to turn left at busy times from the turn lane and at traffic signals. The community also said this was an acceptable trade-off. We've developed a set of guiding principles to inform the design process and determine where openings would be located in the medians. And this, the guiding principles are an example for the median tool where we're not taking a one size fits all approach. The third major tool are the three base cross sections that would be applied as appropriate to provide design options and flexibility for phasing and areas with constrained width. I'd just like to note that um, it's in very light gray, but um, at the base of each cross section is the existing right of way cross section. The constrained width cross section at the top does not change the curb to curb width and primarily exists for short, in the short term to enable phasing. We would postpone or delay the other widths to get in the median safety elements sooner. On this diagram, we show where we are recommending that second and third uh, long-term cross-section. Uh, most of the corridor, we recommend the balanced street width, which would result in approximately four additional feet of right-of-way on each side. For the active transportation enhanced cross-section, we recommend locating it where we already have 
wider existing right of way, approximately between 52nd and 58th. The three base cross sections for the short and long term implementation plus segment specific modifications reflect a flexible approach and not one size fits all. The principal sections of chapter five cover how the toolbox can be implemented and how to use the plan to inform the design process. The section of chapter five that uh, is usually of most interest to folks is the phasing plan. Construction of the full facility plan could take beyond 20 years to complete. So all solutions would be implemented in phases due to limited funding availability. Key factors that we considered in developing the phasing plan include safety, high crash locations and potential benefit to cost ratios, feasibility, considering right of way and other constraints and targeting each phase to be under $10 million, functionality, pairing, the raised medians with roundabouts to limit out of direction travel and consistency, targeting adjacent segments and coordination with other projects. The first phase does have a higher price tag, but for that we are looking for a full comprehensive first phase to showcase what the project can really be. And to help you navigate the figure, the circles indicate roundabouts, the dashed only line uh, reflects the short-term cross-section or implementation of the medians only in the short-term phases. And the dashed line with the outside solid lines indicate the long-term cross-sections, either the balanced uh, street width or the active transportation enhanced. The cloud reflects the interchange study area. And then in the second uh, diagram, the dark gray, um, lines reference the previous four phases, and then again, the circles, the dashed lines, and the solid lines um, are the same pattern as in the first diagram. Our project team evaluated the Springfield Comprehensive Plan, Transportation System Plan, and Springfield Development Code to ensure that the policies and standards reflect the recommendations of the Main Street facility plan. Tech Memo 18 provided a high level summary of the changes needed, while Tech Memo 19, again, that's included in your packet tonight, gets into the details of recommended modifications to language in the Springfield Comprehensive Plan and Springfield Development Code. The Tech Memo recommends amendments in, largely in chapter five of the transportation system plan. It also suggests updates to the preface and other administrative sections. Those would not be amendments, but are recommended to happen simultaneously. Targeted modifications to the Springfield Development Code are recommended to be completed and legislatively adopted to ensure consistency with facility plan implementation. As you may recall, the special street setback provision was added to the development code as part of the TSP implement implementation package in 2020. The special street setback section was intended to ensure that development based only on building permits are located in a way that preserves options for future street, street connectivity should redevelopment occur in the future. It requires that buildings not be constructed on area intended as future right-of-way. The setback doesn't require dedication of right-of-way until development occurs, and it also does not set a right-of-way line. Again, the intent is to ensure that buildings are not constructed in locations that make future streets impossible or highly impractical to construct. The recommended code amendments are to enable that this special street setback provision apply to facility plans and in particular to the Main Street Facility Plan. And it would cover 
the two long-term cross-sections. This fall, we sought feedback on the draft facility plan from our strategic advisory committee and the broader community. We emailed our interested parties list, which includes an average of about 800 members. We also mailed postcards to over 800 adjacent business and property owners, encouraging recipients to review fact sheet number six, which is also included in your packet tonight, uh, to review the draft plan and to provide feedback. As you might expect, we heard varied opinions and preferences from different stakeholder interests, but we did see some common themes emerge. We largely heard positive reception for the project and enthusiasm for the community benefit that would occur upon implementation. People seem to appreciate our engagement uh, of the community in the project and our responsiveness to questions and comments. We received many clarifying questions regarding uh, deliverables, stages, and outcomes. We did hear skepticism about whether the effort and potential corridor impacts are worth the community benefits. And we did hear some lack of confidence in corridor awareness of the project and that the feedback um, that folks had shared had not been addressed as they had desired. Uh, we heard from a number of business and property owners on the corridor that last minute circumstances, lack of interest, other priorities, the online format, and general agency distrust influenced their decision not to engage at particular points in the process. On the draft facility plan itself, again, we heard largely positive feedback both for specific tools and overall, that the toolbox is good and allows for a flexible approach to implementation. We have heard many <laughs> concerns for implementation impacts to site access and usage and out of direction travel for residents, customers, and freight. And I think we talked about this at um, the last time we met, but what we've done is we've created an online map where these concerns are mapped so that when we get to the design phase, we have information about um, particular concerns that folks had about site access and usage. Um, we heard from a lot of people acknowledgement that the safety problem exists, yet doubt that the tools um, presented um, will address uh, that safety problem. And we did receive some suggestions for alternative solution approaches. So now I would um, open it up for questions and comments and turn it back over to um, Chair McGinley. Thank you, Molly. Um, Thank you for your presentation and for all of the work on this project. Um, I don't see any hands, so I'll just start off with my comments. Um, there are a few discussion questions in the packet tonight um, for commissioners to consider. Um, so I just am supportive of the work that the staff has been doing so far. Um, I know that there you know, will never be unanimous community input and um, just want to say, you know, this, this is a life or death matter fixing Main Street. This is one of the most dangerous roads. Um, people have been killed. Children have lost their lives on this road. So I just commend staff for moving forward with this um, and I'm supportive. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? I see Commissioner Landon and then let's throw Commissioner Buck behind him. I was just going to ask, um... How does the balanced with cross section without special street setback differ from the one with? I just I was looking at the picture. I didn't see it. So is Michael on the call? Yeah, what I saw was impressive. By the way, we certainly need that. I'm out on East sixty, you know, sixty uh, seventh. Um, so yeah. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here, Molly. Can you bring up that slide? Oh, yep, sorry.
so the the difference is the um the distance in the future for what the building setback would be so your special street setback will kind of set the line from what you would measure your your future building setback so as development occurs um, once the plan was adopted if you have the um, special street setback then you'd have that 10 foot building setback setback from that that future line whereas if you didn't have that building setback it would go against uh, it would go 10 foot back from the existing right-of-way line so that's the that's the difference the building moves back with new development versus the buildings stay in the same what what happens then is when when the project comes through and we widen stuff it takes up part of that setback for all of the development that happens in between plan adoption and implementation of the balanced switch cross section and if you don't have the special street back setback then when you come through with the project all of those buildings would become non-conforming in terms of um, the required building setback in the code Okay, so there are easements right now that will allow the city to do this without running into legal problems, ownership problems, things like that. I don't believe we have easements on the outside of the existing right of way currently. Um, we typically try to get public utility easements um, as part of development um, outside right of way for utilities. Um, but the building setback is not associated with those utility easements or um, other associated easements. Thank you. Good luck. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Commissioner McGinley. Um, I, I want to first say uh, I very much appreciate all the work that went into this. And I thought the video that um, you put together, Molly, kind of prior for us to look at this prior to this meeting was extremely helpful to me. Um, new to the commission, this uh, preparing for this meeting and, and this meeting was the, kind of my first introduction to this piece of it. So I, I feel a little bit behind and, and I'm, I'm a little hazy on some of the some of the things that were described in terms of when we were looking at like the the the, the diagrams that had the divisions I wasn't wasn't really clear on what those looked like, on what those those looked like in terms of where there would be a median, um, as opposed to crosswalks. Uh, can you help clear some of that up for me in terms of what the what the graphics were showing again? I apologize. Like I said, I'm just trying to get up to speed here. Let me just go back to that. And I, and I recognize that it is, I'm probably the only one that's stuck here, but yeah, just those, Please. If you go back a couple of slides, I'll show you what oh, I was talking about. Oh, keep going back to the medians? Yeah. One more slide, I think it was. Uh, it, it was one of the ones that had the streets and the different. Oh, so maybe this one? Yeah, and a couple others like that. Okay. It, it just, I was I'm struggling to understand exactly get a picture in my head as to what that looks like I apologize Molly sure so the constrained width which is the cross section at the top here that's essentially as you can see with the grayer lines underneath it it's essentially the same width as what's currently on the corridor it's just rearranging some of the um, where the sidewalk the width of the sidewalk as compared to the current existing situation and we recommend that that this constrained width cross section um, be implemented in the first and second phase so that the median, which is in the center here, the eight foot median, um, could be implemented um, more quickly. And the balanced street width and the active transportation enhanced um, cross sections those are intended to do an even better job of enhancing safety and comfort for those walking and biking. And so, though, but they require more right of way. So um, in the next slide, this is the blue is where we recommend the balanced street width. So most of the corridor 
and the green is where we recommend the, the even wider cross section, um, the active transportation enhanced. And in all of these, the raised median is in the center um, where the, the green in the center. Excellent. And then um, I think you, you talked about it in there, but are you building into your plan um, more spots where there's kind of your protected crosswalks? Yep. Uh, so all at any time that uh, a phase would be implemented, we would look for opportunities for additional um, enhanced pedestrian crossings. Okay. Thank you. That's a that that was a significant concern of mine um, with with all of this because pedestrian, as Commissioner McGinley commented earlier. Uh, it's very difficult in a lot of places for pedestrians to find adequate places to cross, and some of the some of the intersections now aren't lit maybe as well as they could be, and um, and so yeah, that's a that, that's a huge safety concern of mine. So thank you very much. I appreciate. It. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. And I'll just note, it's helpful, I think, for anyone watching to ask questions about the whole process. Planning processes take a long time. So I think you being new is an asset for community members that maybe are now just hearing about the project. So please don't apologize for being new. It's great for us to all be reminded. Um, Commissioner Bergen. Awesome. Thank you. I do want to thank you so much, uh, staff, for putting this all together. It's good to hear um, some of the public comment. I know as we've been talking about this over the last, I don't know, how long has it been? Two years, um, this specific one. Um, I have heard a lot of people with concern about, you know, putting the tools there for our community is one thing, um, but then getting the community to actually utilize them. Um, because a lot of the the crosswalks that have the beacons right now are not necessarily being utilized. So I, it's interesting to hear the public say that as well, have that concern. Um, my question was the um, on the graph that you were showing on the lower, the last of the three options, I loved that it had trees. And from my understanding, you said that was primarily thought to be 52nd to 58th um, Street, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, which is great. I uh, love to see that. Um, my question would be for the raised medians, is there the opportunity to have green space in there? I saw that on the graph, it's green um, just below it. And so mm -hmm. I don't know if that was just coincidence or if we have that opportunity or will they all be 100% concrete or will we have the opportunity to have some um, vegetation in there? So vegetation is definitely an option to be explored um, at the time of design. And we've identified the benefits for stormwater management um, and also uh, just the urban heat island effects. Um, maintenance is, is something that will have to be weighed um, with that. Um, and so both ODOT and the city will have to um, weigh in on that. I don't know if Brian or Michael want to add more. I'd be happy to. For the record, Brian Barnett, city traffic engineer. Um, but this is an ODOT facility. However, ODOT will not typically utilize uh, landscaping and vegetation that requires any sort of ongoing maintenance. So that's why they oftentimes end up uh, concrete or something similar. Um, the city of Springfield has maintained uh, different uh, vegetative landscape areas, but we're finding ourselves severely understaffed to be able to accomplish a robust um, program of trimming trees and pulling weeds and cleaning up litter and et cetera. Um, so it is a challenge for us, but it is, as Molly described, it would be a project by project decision um, because nobody knows what the funding situation will be at the time of project. Um, construction. So I think that's a reasonable way to summarize the situation. Thank you. I will put myself in the queue. Molly, is now an appropriate time to weigh in on, on whether green features would be put in or would that be more appropriate later on at the design process? 
I think it would be more appropriate at the design phase. I mean, we, we have um, in the draft facility plan itself, a, a clear desire has been expressed for the green features. And as Brian described, it'll, it will be kind of like a game time decision um, at the time of design. Okay, great, thank you. And happy to see that in the community recommendations. Um, Commissioner Gill. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I'll uh, echo thanks to everyone for all of the work on this project. It's clearly important for the community. Um, and I did want to say that the, well, first I want to say it cracks me up that everybody talks about bringing everybody up to speed on something when we're talking about speed on Main Street. So I'm laughing inside every time that comes up. <laughs> um, but I will say, um, that uh, I really appreciate the depth and breadth and variety of community engagement that happened here. And I think it would be a really incredible, potentially like internship project to take this model and develop a little template guidebook on how to do this with all of the outreach um, because it's been some of the best for um, a lot of the projects that I've seen and, I, and I've had people talk to me about it that I haven't told about it. Um, so that's a really good indicator to me that it's getting out there. And it might be the topic, right? I get that, but, um, but I think that there are, some, there are some good things that were implemented here that, that could be a good, a good guide and a useful tool for the future. Um, I really feel like the toolbox addresses the issues that were presented to us um, over the past conversations we've had. And I think that's really important that there's that direct connection between the challenges and the solutions um, for that. And I think that the case, I think it's conveyed well that that is the case. So I think that's important for um, communication with the community, especially when, um, like folks have said, we can't, we can't please everybody with everything, but um, if they feel heard and we can um, respond to those things, but then also show that tie, I think that's really important. Um, I think the code update is critical. It's also a commitment to this work. Um, and I think that it is important because this is a long game to do this. This is expensive. Um, it's a big deal. And the, um, Putting these things into code will help assure that this work can continue despite changes in leadership or attitude or things like that. It would have to be a, a pretty serious process to um, adjust that. So I, I think that is an important commitment for the city to take. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Gill. Commissioner Salazar, and I I saw another hand. Maybe it was put down. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to, to echo um, what the other commissioners have said so far in terms of applauding the work that's been put into this project. I think this toolbox is, is excellent, especially in terms of um, promoting um, safety and meeting the goals of, of making a safer community. Um, and especially would like to uh, echo Commissioner Gill's statements about outreach and community outreach. I really loved the clearing up misconceptions um, two pager that you put together. And I think that really shows one, that you're serious, that your team is serious about listening to community feedback and hearing, sifting through that feedback, listening to what's coming up in the community and um, finding out what the major themes are and clearing up misconceptions when they come up in those themes. So I really think that, um, yeah, this is this is a great way of showing that you're listening to the community and just trying to be transparent about the process as well. Um, so really applaud that and hope to see that um, in future planning projects not related to this as well. I think this is just a great best practice. Thank you. Commissioner Quivela, followed by Commissioner Buck. Commissioner Quivela, you're muted. 
got to be it's got to be someone. Um, well, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Molly. Great presentation. Um, I'd like to echo Commissioner Gill and Commissioner Salazar about the great outreach that's been done on this. Um, really, really good commu community uh, engagement and inclusive of various points of view, which I think is really important too, because I know some people who were uh, on the technical advisory committee um, really probably initially started, I'm not sure if they're still against the program, but uh, initially started uh, being against it. Um, uh, my comments, but that definitely the community engagement should be emulated. It's just been really wonderful on this. Um, my comments on this, it's really good to see enforcement finally being mentioned as part of the long-term uh, solution to Main Street safety, because I think uh, both uh, a lot of the problems that, um, that have caused some of the crashes, including distracted driving, speeding, following too close, um, they can be definitely uh, uh, affected by better enforcement. So it's nice to see that again. Uh, comments, uh, again, the one size fits all, I have a concern about that, because if we have a continuous, nearly, uh, identical center line uh, raised median. We have uh, location and sizes of lanes um, nearly continuous throughout the corridor and um, two lanes each way, uh, most of the time uh, curbside sidewalks, et cetera. Um, and that uh, the curbs are linear and parallel with the, with the uh, center line without any like pedestrian bulb outs or anything like that. I really kind of look at that and say, that sure looks like a one size fits all to me. Um, I think if you drove it after it was completed, it would, if, if it's as envisioned, I think it's gonna look like a one size fits all. And then my question regarding this is regarding that this is a 20 year time frame, And as Mr. Barnett said, if there's a chance that the funding may be variable on this. Um, if there's uh, considerable structural or like economic changes result in maybe either decreased need for as many lanes as we're designing for, or for some other reason, can the plan be adjustable in the future to create major changes based on change conditions? Thank you. I'm gonna have Brian, um... Sure. The, um, the plan doesn't call for a specific number of lanes as a minimum standard. So in other words, we're not boxed into we have to have a five lane cross section until we get out to the extreme east end. Any project that would be funded would also be interested in saving money if they don't need a, a lane. And so uh, an example of analysis that's already been done that uh, relates to that is the uh, roundabout um, sketch level designs. They have a variety of different lane configurations indicating based on the current traffic volume projections for the 20 year horizon, they've been sized appropriately to provide that capacity needed. If that those volumes change over time or the projections of those volumes change over time, then we most certainly would adjust those designs. Um, so there isn't a, a desire to maintain a five-lane cross session in its entirety through the corridor. It's just simply a desire to make sure we have capacity for the vehicles that we anticipate. Now, I will be the first to admit that transportation modeling for a time horizon 20 years in the future is uh, somewhat of a dark art. And the ability to accomplish an accurate estimation is, is not something that I would stake my reputation on. But what I will say is that it, there is regular opportunity to update those projections and make a, a, the best available choice that we can. In terms of the um, notion of one size fits all, each design project will have its opportunity to do the best it can to fit the project cross section in the space that's available or the space that's deemed available through acquisition. One thing to note is that when we do acquire property, 
Um, we would certainly like to acquire a property where it has the le least amount of impact and the least amount of cost. But there can become equity concerns that if we're going to take uh, through right away um, acquisition process, we're going to purchase four feet on one side and six feet on the other side. Well, the person who owns the six foot side may be asking, well, where's the equity in that? Let's share that at five feet each. Um, I can't predict what would happen in a specific situation, but I'm just pointing that out to illustrate there are some concerns um, in terms of trying to vary the right away acquisition from one side to the next. The other thing I'd mention about uh, moving the curb lines in or out on a widening project, of course, we're not going to narrow those curbs uh, unless we're actually truly removing a traffic lane um, in a project. But more generally, we would be widening those curbs out or widening the right of way out and be using that extra space for the enhanced types of cross sections with more bike buffer and more sidewalk space. Um, <clears throat> In those circumstances, though, each designer is going to look at what they can do with the space they have and do the best they can with it. There are transitions um, that are required, transition lengths between shifting a lane or shifting a, a bike lane laterally uh, to some extent to try and fit the space. You do have to account for the fact that although there might be a short length or a property or two that where you could have a shift, you have to make a transition from the previous section and then on into the next section. And for a four foot shift, that could be anywhere from 80 to 180 feet of transition length. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Quibla? Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Buck. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so one of the other questions that I that, that came up as I was thinking through this is um, how has um, accesses to the, the businesses along the corridor, you know, be, been considered in terms of in terms of traffic flow and in terms of getting in and out of them? Um, it, an example in my mind is I, I live out in the Thurston area and <clears throat> at certain times of the day, the, the area around 58th and Main, there's a Dutch Brothers there. There's lots of traffic coming into town, going out of town, schools, all of that kind of stuff. It can get a little bit insane at, at certain points of the day. And so I kind of wonder with how how some of our businesses um, are sitting as, as they speak, as they are now, and, and how people get in and out of them. Um, are, is the thought process that, that having roundabouts and having kind of one-way flow traffic on either side of the corridor would alleviate some of that so that um, the flow kind of all goes one way or what's the thought process in terms of terms of getting in and out of those those businesses? Um, I don't know if that question makes sense, but that's kind of what I'm wondering about. I think Michael um, or Brian I am, would be best equipped since Michael's um, interacted a lot with businesses. Um, on the corridor when working to install the pedestrian, um, enhanced pedestrian crossings. So uh, Brian, you want me to take that one? I don't know if either. I'll That'd go ahead and take fine, it. Michael. <laughs> so yeah, business access um, may very well benefit from, you know, paired roundabouts specifically um, and delays associated with you know, left turns or inability to have gaps. If if you were a, a business and you're you're able to take a right, a safer right, and get into the travel stream faster than having to wait for a gap in traffic. Um, the area out at 58th um, already has a median um, between 58th and there with the limited access into the um, um, shopping center to the north. Um, and so, um, 
what we do is when we're in design, that's part of the, the advantage of having the roundabouts um, paired with the medians is being able to look at how different accesses um, um, would work in relation to the um, acceptable delay that the community has has looked at us. And then um, if they're, they're making another turn to a different direction that doesn't have a direct immediate um, roundabout, then we would be looking at available gaps in traffic for other roadways to do turnarounds to come back. So um, all around, typically the roundabouts provide a, a better capacity and a more even flow um, through the corridor, which may help to alleviate um, some of the congestions concerns we see specifically at peak times um, around those signals that you mentioned, Commissioner. Hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, I'd like to just simply add a little bit to what Michael said is that um, there, there can be the perception that this median is going to be continuous. And in, in reality, it is intended to have openings at almost every single public street intersection. So left turns in and out of those um, public street intersections. Um, and some we, we are open to consideration of a left in type of access to commercial in, uh, sites that are have very high traffic volume um, and potentially left out. So there will be a lot of opportunity to make turns and also for a passenger vehicle at those public street intersections, you certainly will have enough space to make a U-turn unless you have one of the largest pickups. But you know, a typical vehicle, no problem with making a U-turn in those types of situations. Commissioner Landon. One of the things I remember from Europe is that they use lane narrowing. Are we doing that? If you, when you narrow the road, it slows people down. Yes, we're showing a, a 11 foot travel lanes and that is uh, somewhat less than what is out there today. Um, we also are mindful of the need to provide adequate space for the commercial traffic that is uh, in the corridor. And I believe 11 foot is ODOT's minimum. Uh, allowable width for a lane in that context. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. I've heard a lot of support for um, the staff, what staff has put together. I've also heard a lot of, of support and kudos for staff engagement. Um, I think I just echo all of that. Um, it's been really exceptional to see, and a lot of it has been done in a pandemic. And so that just has added a challenge and it's really encouraging to see the work that's been going on. Um, one of the questions um, in the discussion questions in the packet um, is, do you have any additional reflections as we prepare the draft plan for public hearing? So that is a next step. So I just wanted to give the commission um, space if there's anything that has not been said tonight, any big concerns or big comments before we kick off the public hearings process, um, this would be the time. Um, you of course can also always reach out to staff. So I think everyone here has Molly's email and phone number, but that's also an option. Um, so, and also just letting you know if something big does come up, um, we're not constrained by time tonight. So even though this is scheduled to be a 60 minute work session item, we can go beyond that. Um, but it looks like there's no more questions or comments. Molly, did you have any closing um, closing remarks? Um, just wanted to um, let the commission know that um, what's coming up in the rest of November and December, we will be going to the ODOT Mobility Advisory Committee. Um, the Main Street Governance Team is also meeting in a couple of weeks. And then um, we have a work session scheduled in early December with the City Council. And then we will take all of the feedback on the draft facility plan that we will have received in this fall and we'll be um, revising it and getting it ready for um, public hearings that would start uh, with the planning commission in February. Great, thank you, Molly. Any questions or comments about the next steps? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Molly, for that 
um, work session item and for all of the work that staff has done. Um, thank you, Michael Liebler and Brian Barnett for being here as well. Um, I have it at as 6.55. Um, let's take a five minute break before our next item. So um, same Zoom link, but everyone can turn off their camera or you can stay on and just chat with staff. Um, but we'll move on to the next item at seven o'clock. Thank you. Make sure everyone. <laughs> yes. Just to make sure everyone is here. Okay, I see everybody now. Um, great. So we can resume our work session. Um, the next topic on our agenda is the development code update. Um, I will hand it over to City Attorney Mary Bridget Smith to give um, a statement regarding conflicts of interest. Uh, good evening, Planning Commission. I'm here again to talk about uh, conflicts of interest. So I'm gonna do a little um, summary of conflicts of interest and then the chair will go around and ask you about your potential conflicts. So similar to Main Street Safety Project Facility Plan, commissioners may only have a potential conflict of interest regarding the code update project because the future recommendation to the council is not binding. Commissioners with, with potential conflicts of interest must disclose the nature of the conflict and then can participate in the work session. An example of a potential conflict of interest related to the code update project is owning residential or commercial land in Springfield because property values may be affected by the proposed changes. Uh, and I think that's it for my uh, part and then just time to declare. Thank you. Start with myself. Um, I do not own property, um, so I have no potential conflicts of interest. Commissioner Landon. Potential conflict of interest because I own a residence in Springfield. Thank you. Commissioner Buck. Uh, two potential conflicts of interest. I own property in Springfield and I write uh, insurance in Springfield as well. Thank you. Commissioner Gill. I have a potential conflict of interest in that I own property in Springfield. Thank you. Commissioner Salazar. I have two potential conflicts of interest. One is that I own residential property in Springfield and the other that I work for a real estate developer that operates in Springfield. Thank you, Commissioner Cuevilla. Uh, same, uh, own property in Springfield, so a potential conflict. Thank you, and Commissioner Bergen. Two potential conflicts of interest. First, um, being a property owner in Springfield and second, selling, uh, being a an active realtor in, in Springfield. Thank you. And now I will hand it over to Mark Rust and Arva Hussein um, to give the development code update. Great, thank you, Commissioner McGinley and good evening, commissioners. Uh, I am Mark Rust, current planning manager with the city of Springfield and I'll introduce or let Arva introduce herself as well tonight. Hey, Commissioners, my name is Arma Hussain and I'm working with Mark. Uh, I'm a PSU fellow uh, working with Mark on the Development Code Update Project. Nice to see you all today. So we're here to talk to you tonight a little bit about some more focused topics. We're moving away from the middle housing topics that we've been talking with you on. And um, we have a couple specific topics tonight that are in your packet. I'll just briefly go through the attachments that are in your packet tonight. The, there is a memo that outlines a little bit of what we'll be talking about. And I do wanna point out that the draft code sections in your packet tonight are different from any of the previous code sections that you've been seeing for a while. All the previous draft code sections have been basically the same draft code sections that went out at the beginning of the summer for public comment. We have now revised or made some changes to those draft code sections in response um, to some comments we've heard. We've added more notes and we're starting to make changes in order to prepare the final public hearing versions of these. And so wanting to get some of those changes in front of you tonight for your input and feedback. We are looking for um, some kind of the more informal kind of direction from you tonight, kind of the straw poll types of direction. Um, if there's different than what you see in the draft code tonight, if, if there's agreement on 
what we'll be talking about tonight. I don't feel like we need specific direction, but if there's changes you want to see incorporated into the public hearing draft before it comes in front of this body in the formal public hearing, um, we could hear that tonight. So the three code sections are those updated drafts. The final attachment, attachment five, is a copy of the piece of legislation that we're going to start with tonight talking about. It's a pretty short piece of legislation. It's really just a one paragraph or maybe even one sentence, House Bill 2583. And really what it's talking about is how cities can regulate maximum occupancy limits in dwellings. And so what it it's limiting the ability to regulate occupancy by family status or family or non-family relationships. So I'm going to go through the draft code sections in quite a bit of detail. Um, I do want to share my screen here first. I do have the PowerPoint presentation slides. I like to just go through some of these initial ones that we um, normally go through just for the public that may be viewing or view the meeting later. So this is the Springfield Development Code Update Project. And I like to always share the purpose statement of the project that's contained in the community engagement plan. I'm not gonna read it, but there it is for all of you, as well as the objectives of the overall project. This, these objectives are also approved by this body acting at, in your capacity as the Committee for Citizen Involvement and are included in that community engagement plan for the project. This is the overall project timeline. We're now here um, in phase one represented by the yellow bars as well as phase two represented by the orange bars moving into this, um, this formal uh, adoption steps of the project. So with that, just um, Going into House Bill 2583, it was just adopted or passed by the state legislature this year, this last legislative session. So it's pretty brand new legislation. Um, we're having to react to quite a few pieces of new legislation, and we'll be talking more about a lot of other pieces of legislation at the Joint Planning Commission City Council meeting next Monday and you'll be getting a list of those other pieces of legislation in the packet for that meeting but we are just so focusing on this one tonight um, it has a lot of small i would say kind of smallish impacts um, a lot of different definitions within the code so i'll cite to a few of these really quick and we can um, get into more detail or go to these exact sections of the code the definition of family itself is an existing definition in our code. It's in the attachment four. It's on page 14 of 46 of that attachment four in your packet tonight. That definition of family we've proposed to delete altogether. As you may recall, um, through some of the discussions in the middle housing um, talk, we're proposing to change some of the terminology that we use. Instead of using single family dwelling, we're proposing to change it to single unit dwelling. So things like that to go away from using the word family altogether. Another definition that we are um, modifying on page 13 to 46 of attachment for tonight is the definition of dwelling unit itself. Um, we're proposing, that's where we're actually proposing to change how we regulate the occupancy level. What we've based this, and, and so I'll just read the sentence we've proposed to add. It says total occupancy of a dwelling unit must not exceed two persons per bedroom plus one additional person, regardless of whether occupants are related or unrelated. So our pre-existing definition of family talked about a maximum of five unrelated people could live in a dwelling. Um, so we've gone away from that. This proposed sentence we're proposing to add is based off of the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. They have this 
threshold of two people per bedroom plus one. It's, it's related though, mostly to landlord tenant kind of relations and how landlords can regulate occupancy in rental units. Um, I think we're just proposing it in my mind as a starting place for discussion. And I think the example I use is if there were a family say with two parents or two adults and six kids that in a three bedroom house that would exceed this threshold. And in my mind also then there's difficulties around how that may be enforced. If we were to be say made aware of a family of six kids and two adults living in a three bedroom house, how, what would we do about it? How would that be enforced is probably a tricky um, question. So there's a number of other definitions I've listed here. There's previous definition for foster home and group care home, also halfway house and then boarding house. Um, when I mentioned boarding house, I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit when we talk more about um, bed and breakfast and short-term rentals. We propose, there's current special development standards for boarding and rooming houses, but those two terms are defined differently. So, but we are proposing <clears throat> to delete the term boarding house or the definition for the term boarding house, and then modify the definition of rooming house. Let me just see here. The other thing we're proposing to do then in terms of how we're proposing to regulate occupancy based on two people per bedroom and um, plus one additional person is add a definition for the term, the word bedroom. That's on page three of 46 of attachment four, the definition section of the code. And so we've, we've tried to frame at least the term bedroom fairly loosely. It's um, sometimes, I don't know if realtors sometimes talk about a room having a closet or not being considered a bedroom versus maybe a den or some other room. Um, that would not be part of this definition. It's really any room that contains at least 70 square feet and in, um, includes a door that can be closed and a secondary egress such as a window. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to meet current building code standards for that egress as well because some older homes have that second window or second egress but the window say may be too high to actually qualify under current building code standards but it was built as a bedroom maybe prior under different building code regulations. So those are a, a pretty quick look at the implications from how we're proposing to implement House Bill 2583. I see a hand up. Um, let me expand my window. Um, and I don't know, Chair, if you want to call on people or I'm happy to, but Commissioner Bergen. Mark, you can go ahead. Okay. Commissioner Bergen, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Just quick clarification on that bedroom. And you're right. We do, as um, in the industry, typically um, for lender requirement, require a closet. For this requirement, are we talking conforming or could somebody um, put up four walls in a garage, for example, and it be unpermitted or non-conforming and count and, and that would work? Or are we talking just strictly conforming units that were... Um, that have gone through the proper protocols, the proper um, permitting process? Yeah, I or think is that that's not, a, is that too far in the weeds? Well, no, I don't think it's too far in the weeds. I think it's a really good question because we don't get into that level of detail in the proposed definition, at least. And so I think it's a good clarification. Would we um, consider unpermitted rooms at, if it met the egress and, and door standard as um, meeting that standard. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Our, our building, I think we would, it's an opportunity where we would potentially need to be more specific on how we define bedroom. Um, again, I, I mentioned older, you know, it, it would get pretty difficult to determine in some cases, depending on the example, if something was permitted or not, say 
40 years ago or something like that when we didn't don't have good records. Um, there is an idea that instead of regulating the way we've proposed is to just let the building code occupancy limits regulate how many people and we don't really get into regulating the number of people in a dwelling. So that would be potentially another avenue. But again, we're proposing this avenue for discussion purposes, but I don't have a great answer for your question. It, I don't think we're clear on that. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna jump next to kind of a discussion about short-term rentals or what we're just tentatively calling rooming houses for lack of a better term. So this, there's some of the implications I've talked about regarding family and not being able to regulate by occupancy and family relation status also kind of goes into the rooming and boarding house uses that we have in our code currently. As I mentioned, we're proposing to do away with the boarding house use. And it also, so then it kind of raises the question of what we currently call or think of as traditional bed and breakfasts. And then we also have this use of rooming houses and we have special standards for those. Um, in a nutshell, basically we're talking about changing essentially the term bed and breakfast to rooming houses and having it be more of an umbrella and encompass short-term rentals and keep basically the existing bed and breakfast standards. And so Arva has done some work on this and thought about it and been looking at other jurisdictions. She's um, able to talk in more detail about some of the thinking around how this can be done and then if there's questions. So Arva, do you wanna kind of talk a little bit about um, a little bit more on this topic? Uh, thanks, Mark. So yes, so as Mark alluded to, the city currently regulates uh, short-term rentals when they fall under a certain category, such as a bed and breakfast. But, but these regulations do not consistently apply to you know, short-term rentals, which are rented to online platforms such as Airbnb or Verbo uh, for that matter. So, uh, and I've looked through several cities and counties in Oregon, um, which have like, some regulatory mechanism for uh, short-term rentals, um, mostly either through a land use permit or through a, uh, or through a licensing. Um, so particularly city of Bend and Portland, uh, they both require land use approval for short-term rentals. Uh, other cities such as Hillsborough and Beaverton require licensing or registration uh, for short-term rentals. So, so these mechanisms, these regulatory mechanisms kind of you know, represent a way to lim limit potential negative impacts uh, that, that a short-term rental may have in the neighborhood. Uh, and, and there have been you know, uh, 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 complaints about these impacts uh, in, in, you know, in, in, there have been several complaints around in cities uh, around Oregon. So, uh, and and some of the potential impacts such as like in, uh, uh, increase in noise or on street parking or trash management, uh, they have, which have been reported in communities around Oregon, um, these could be uh, these impacts could be better addressed if the city have uh, specific regulations around STRs. Um, so so that's that's one of the way of looking at uh, 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 how we can encompass the uh, the STR regulations. In, in the code. Um, another concern with short-term rental uh, is that it, it impact, uh, the impact it may have on the housing affordability and long-term rental housing. Um, uh, that's a um, housing affor affordability uh, for the matter because uh, with the middle house uh, implementation, we are trying to address um, the, the issue of housing affordability. And, and there have been several national studies mostly focused uh, that are mostly focused on large large cities that have linked uh, increase in um, increases in short term rentals such as Airbnb to increase housing costs and rents. So, so while like Springfield may not be a large city, but it is a growing one uh, and it's already experiencing uh, increased housing costs. 
so, so we need to be more sensitive around including uh, uh, how to include the SGR regulations in this code update. So, so those are two, uh, two ways of looking at uh, uh, the SGR regulations or uh, just how we would like to think of regulating uh, uh, the short term rentals uh, for the city. Yeah, great. Thank you, Arva. And I just want to point out, so we are proposing a definition in attachment four, uh, page 36, uh, it, for rooming house that we're, again, using as kind of a placeholder for the term. Um, again, that, that term rooming house could easily, I think, be switched to short term rental, or we're proposing that that replace the term bed and breakfast. But whatever the term ends up being, the definition limits we're proposing at least that it's um, when lodging is provided for compensation for a period of less than 30 consecutive calendar days um, counting portions of a calendar year or calendar days as full days but for more than seven calendar days per year so i think those kind of book ends of time frame are important in thinking about if somebody wanted to rent their home just for, say, a weekend because they were going to be out of town or something and um, it wouldn't necessarily trigger or fall into the category of, in this case, boarding house um, or even two weekends, say two three day weekends a year would be six calendar days, um, wouldn't trigger that threshold of seven days a year. And then if you're over 30 days, it really it also falls outside of the short-term rentals standards or boarding house standards, because at, after 30 days, it's more of a landlord tenant type of situation where it's maybe month to month or something different than short-term. And then the special standards that we've basically kept and, and retitled in the uh, attachment three, um, it's page 58 of 61, section 4.7395, are basically the previous bed and breakfast special standards. And again, we've just retitled them to rooming house standards. Um, and those are also probably an area for discussion. And again, we felt like once, you know, I think, and Commissioner Cravula has brought up this topic of, you know, including short-term rentals as a use. And when we started looking at the, we really found, well, we are regulating some types of short-term rentals, bed and breakfast. And so really, is there a difference between if somebody's providing breakfast versus not providing breakfast? And so some of those delineations um, may not be critical, but the impacts from the different types of uses as Arva talked about could be similar. So that's really all I was gonna say about that. I think there were opportunity for questions and we can talk more about some of the details. And then the last thing I just wanna to present tonight quickly is the kind of third portion of the topic or leg of the stool tonight our other comments and suggested changes that we've received. Um, Commissioner Cravula has provided fairly detailed comments and suggestions. We've, his most recent um, set of comments and, and questions and suggestions we have incorporated into these drafts of code tonight. In a lot of the cases, we've provided some sort of brief response and we're happy to talk further about any of those. We wanted to include them so that um, we can make note of them, obviously, and work to address them. There are a couple instances that I thought I would point out that are ha we have proposed edits to the code sections based on those comments. The first one, and they're both fairly minor. Um, one is really just a typo, and it's in um, they're both in attachment for the definition section. The first one is on page 11 and it's under the definition. I better just turn to it. So I make sure and get it right. Page 11 of 46, 
the existing definition for direct tributary to a water quality limited water course. Um, it's just a typo in the last sentence of that paragraph of definition. It was previously the word if, and it was appropriately in my mind and pointed out that it really should be of instead of if. So we proposed that change based on that comment. And then second on page 15 of the definition section, the, the term that's defined is fence, site obscuring, and the suggestion was to change the previous term cyclone fence and change it to a more potentially appropriate or commonly used term of chain link fence instead of cyclone fence. So with all the suggestions and questions and comments, those are the actual only two edits we've incorporated. However, we're open to making other edits based on comments and suggestions received by the commission. Um, we've left open the opportunity to talk further about them and um, explore them further. So with that, I'm happy to entertain questions or talk further about anything. Thank you, nice. Mark. Mm -hmm. I have Commissioner Quavela followed by Commissioner Bergen. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I did also include a number of suggested changes to definitions where I felt that there were some def definitions that were perhaps better modified. So for instance, just as an example, there was a definition of demolition, which when you read the definition that was behind it, only spoke about demolition of historic structures. So my suggestion was to say either use a standard definition for the term or to change the heading of the definition if, if it was the desire to have definition of historic structures as an item, for instance, um, to say demolition, comma, historic structures, and then go into the definition. I had a number of those that I thought that the definition was trying to be too specific. There was also one that was particularly, a number of them were also particularly related to land surveys. And um, I thought that there were a number of those that were erroneous as well, or perhaps too detailed. So just wanted to bring that up. Commissioner Bergen. Thank you. I um, just want to throw out there to suggest that we proceed with caution on regulating short-term rentals. Um, I have seen across the country in various capacities that I hold uh, with the National Association of Realtors where communities across the country are trying to regulate short-term rentals. Um, and there's a lot of pushback. And in fact, people are looking for funding to fight that because that's not what the communities want. Um, and so I'd be nervous that we would have the same pushback if we're trying to correct a problem that people are utilizing to um, have an additional source of income. Um, and I know that in some places, a uh, source of income is a protected class, if you will. Um, and so I think that would be something that we just need to, if we are going to regulate short-term rentals for the, the great reasons that you've mentioned, it takes off rental units from the rental market um, and um, potential obstruction of um, noise and, and extra traffic on uh, in neighborhoods. I just would really, really caution us in over-regulating that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bergen. I have Commissioner Quivla followed by Commissioner Salazar, and then I'll throw myself in the queue. Uh, very briefly, I wanted to thank Commissioner Bergen for that comment. Um, my intention in bringing up the short-term rentals was rather than having them, was not to even discuss regulating them, but just to have them in the code as a land use, because I recognize that they're an increasing land use, not only within the city, but throughout the country, and to have a code update that doesn't include um, just even a definition of them, I thought was unwise. Thank you. And if I could just um, chime in really quick, 
Chairman Kinley, the and I agree completely, Commissioner Cravula. You you didn't intend you you were clear that you didn't propose to regulate them. When we started to look at it, we felt well, we are regulating bed and breakfasts, which is some type of short term rental, and so doesn't it just we're raising the question now with you um, is should we just continue to regulate traditional bed and breakfasts as we have or seeing it as an opportunity to potentially um, change it or expand it or I agree with the, the caution and not overly regulating and so maybe the B&Bs the traditional B&Bs have been overly regulated so anyway I think this is all very valid discussion and we're open to that so thank you thank you Mark Commissioner Salazar thank you chair um, yeah, I think I just yeah echo what the other commissioners have said. I, I do support, um, yeah, really bringing this code into the 21st century, which is what this process is supposed to be aimed at, and um, acknowledging that short-term rentals is a common use and um, certainly probably far more common than, than traditional bed and breakfast at this point. So I really do support combining those definitions, whether we call it short-term rental or rooming house, just, yeah, combining those, treating them as um, the same or similar similar entities in terms of how they're regulated in the code. Um, I think, yeah, um, it, along the same lines of, of what the what Commissioner Bergen and Commissioner Cuevla have mentioned, I think um, I'm not sure if this, um, process is appropriate for for or or if this body is appropriate for making regulations around um, short term rentals, the extent to which we could do that or what levers we would have to do that. Uh, I don't certainly have any proposals right now, but um, I think just I would urge us to to um, yeah, uh, as other commissioners have mentioned, be cautious, but also be be mindful of the ways that short-term rentals um, do impact um, our community's housing options if it makes more sense for a property owner financially to um, rent out a property for short-term rentals rather than rent a person who lives in this community um, that takes one one unit away from a potential um, citizen who'd be looking for for a place to live and that make that shorten um, yeah, damper supply for for those of us in our community who are looking for housing. So I think just being mindful of um, the ways that that short term rentals can impact the the, the long term rental market, and thinking about and researching what tools we could have as a commission and um, to to um, make sure that that it isn't the wild west out there as well thank you commissioner salazar i have myself in the queue followed by commissioner buck and then commissioner gill um i have two comments one is on short-term rentals um i am on the fence here um because i think short-term rentals can look really different you know there are properties where that is their use you know they are short-term rentals year-round and then there's properties where people leave town for the weekend or open up their guest bedroom for the track and field championships or a duck game and so there's a residential use and then also the short-term rental use at the same time and so um, I'm just wary of that and I, I don't know the proper solution and I don't know that um, a jurisdiction has found the proper solution yet um you know there's a lot of ideas of what to do and you know it's something that um that is new so just echo a lot of commissioner salazar sentiments and um acknowledge that we'll have to be flexible and i think city council will have to make some policy decisions coming up um my other comment is on house bill 2583 and i'm a little uncomfortable with the proposed definition of single dwelling having an occupancy limit of two persons per bedroom plus one additional person. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with that because the building code already 
um, regulates occupancy. And so I don't know that that necessarily belongs in the land use code. And I don't know that I would that I would want the land use code to you know, punish families, you know, that, that have, um, you know, my mom's a triplet. So like, you know, they were not expecting like buy one, get two free. And so, you know, how do, if there are families who can't afford a larger space or a place with more bedrooms, you know, I just feels a little weird to me. So I think because we have another document that, um, you know, that enforces occupancy limits, that's where that should be for safety purposes. And I just think regulating um, unrelated people or related people living together in the land use code um, is, is not really what I would like to see. Um, Commissioner Buck, followed by Commissioner Gill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also was going to uh, make the same comment as uh, Commissioner McGinley about house about the house bill um you know it's i mean I, I have the same same position as her it struck me as as i don't know it didn't kind of sit quite right that you know we're we're going to recommend or regulate how many people can be in a bedroom and those kind of things and um, i was not aware that it's regulated in another document which kind of further is that so that, that's just something that's that struck me um uh the other the other comment um as i was kind of thinking about the short-term rentals uh i i am a lot of what's been said here by commissioners uh, salazar and mcginley um and commissioner bergen uh makes sense to me and i and i agree with that I think for me, it comes down to those definitions. And I think those definitions are gonna be really, really important. I think telling property owners that, um, I mean, properties that that's their purposes, short-term rentals, that Airbnb, and, and that's, it becomes an income property um, like that. I, I think that that, is much different than an Airbnb that's that's occasional, and and I don't know exactly how to separate that out, but I think that for me those definitions are really really important, and just how far we go in regulating how people can use their own properties, because to me there's something about you know. I when I think about myself as a property owner, if the land use code is going to tell me how I can use my property, not just what I can put there, but how I can utilize it, I don't know. You know that that you know it, it's it starts to starts to create question marks for me. Now, as I said, it's different if my intended use for the property is is short-term or long-term rental and it's an income property but um you know and then i also think about there's lots of people i know that will have families that come to town and there's spots on their property where there's where they put them in a trailer or something like that you know and so i think that those kind of things all those scenarios come into play and i do do think that for me, those definitions are really important. Um, and so those are just thoughts that I have, not necessarily concrete per se, but those are those are some things that stand out to me. And I, I don't know where those lines necessarily get um, get drawn, but uh, I, I think that's that's something to consider. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. Mark, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to respond to any of that? I'll wait a, a few more minutes and see if Commissioner Gill has other comments. Okay, great. Commissioner Gill. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks again, Mark, for all of your work um, and everyone else involved uh, in this work, Arba, as well. Um, I have a few things. One is, uh, I. 
I just will throw my hat in the ring about the concern about occupancy in a development code. I just don't think that that's the job of the development code. Um, it's not the right spot for it. But I do appreciate the changing the language of the term family and the units that we've been talking about for a while. I think that that is absolutely critical. Um, and I think it's meaningful for a lot of uh, groups who are living together <laughs> and view themselves as, as a family, um, that how we talk about those things is important. And, um, and that does, that is impacted in the development code. Um, I do wanna make a pitch, I guess, and I, I, I'm gonna say it out loud and then I'll probably propose it during the public hearing process. Um, the, the council direction on this was to make was to make this code clearer and um, easier to use, and frankly, um, to make development easier. And I just would like to encourage conversation with this body since we get to do recommendations to the council that they really consider. Mm, a little added complexity to this code so that there is an opportunity for incentives or, and that not that we come up with it, but just like, we would like to see that happen. Incentives for needed housing, for other things that we've talked about. So um, I don't think that language is gonna be proposed for the public documents. And I think that's fine. Um, I think that's appropriate based on the direction of the council, but I do really want to, I would like us to have some conversation about that during the public hearing process uh, and encourage some adjustment in that realm um, away from the simplicity to the effective and the long-term care and thinking about the impacts of what this development code will mean down the road and to uh, enhance opportunity for people to have safe and secure and good housing and the ability to purchase if they're anywhere near there or have interest in it. <laughs> um, I think that's really important. Um, but as this is moving forward to the public, I, I, I feel like it's following the direction of the council and um, has done some really good work to address a lot of the challenges that were in the older code. I did want to ask one question and uh, about um, something I brought up, I can't remember when, within the last two meetings or so. Um, I'm just really curious, I'd like us to think about, and I'd love to hear if um, staff had an opportunity to have conversations or think more deeply or just mark you about the idea of we have this middle housing language from the state and um, it's being put into the special standards section because duplexes used to be in the special standards section. But I would like to see us as a community view all the, all the middle housing and single unit dwellings as housing like regular, not special. <laughs> and so within these zones of res residential um, single unit, the special thing is that big multi-unit housing, but now middle housing is not supposed to be special. And I, it maybe seems small, but I feel like it actually is kind of meaningful to put these in like, this is regular practice. This is, this is not special things. This is like what we do in here. Um, and so I would love to hear what commissioners and staff think about that. I feel like it structurally does provide some, some recognition that it isn't, that there isn't this one type within these areas. It's these types within these areas and then these things are, are special and unique within those areas. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gill. Um, Sandy and Mark, you can both respond as needed or interchangeably. Um. I'm happy to let Sandy go first. And Yeah, I just had a thought 
not in terms of the broader questions that you've raised recently, Commissioner Gill, but in terms of the rooming house or short-term rental, you know, when I look at the definition of rooming house, it looks to me like it's intended to be used by someone who is living in that space and then they rent out portion of the house, which to me is different than having a unit that is devoted exclusively as an income property where you don't live. And so I just, hearing your discussion, um, Commissioner McGinley, I think you're the one that sparked it in my mind that there's a difference between renting out a room that you live in versus having this house that's not available as housing as Commissioner Salazar was talking about. So there might be a difference um, between those two types where it's exclusively income generating and not a residence versus a residence that also has some space that could be rented out um, for short term. And yeah, I was actually gonna point out that same concept. And if you look at the actual special development standards for what used to be B&Bs and is now under rooming houses, it's section 4.7.355 on page 29 of 62 in attachment three. But um, the one of the standards it says is owner or operator occupied. And it goes on to say the rooming house must be owned or operator occupied and must maintain the ex exterior physical characteristics of a single unit dwelling. So I think that goes to what Sandy was just saying is that the way it's contemplated is that it is a home that somebody lives in and then they're renting out portions of it. It's not just a, a vacant single family home that's rented out as an entire house on the weekends or out for a week at a time or something. So I agree with some of the other comments about that it's a kind of a touchy subject. It's like, how do you wade into this and um, get it right? Or I think it would be easy to get it not right. Um, you know, and so again, I because the council has directed us to kind of stay policy neutral, when I looked at the B&B &B standards, I thought, well, what if we just tried to apply these to any short-term rental? But then the question in my mind comes up, what if, so what about the other houses that sit vacant and people just wanna rent for a weekend or a week at a time? Um, what, where do those fall? Do we define those differently and say they're not allowed or not regulate them at all? And so it creates this weird dilemma of how we, you know, back to I think Commissioner Quavila's original suggestion is at least defining them uh, and I think um, a couple of the other commissioners talked about the definitions are critical. And so how we define, even if that's all we do um, is define them for just purposes of thinking ahead. Um, anyway, I don't have the answers. I'm looking to some of you for all this input and we can all think about it together. I think in my mind, um, so not to jump too far ahead, but for next steps is we're going to be reconvening for hopefully a final two hour work session on all the draft code sections in two weeks. And um, I could get the date, it's uh, what, November uh, 16th. And so this would be a topic that we could probably bring back on that next work session meeting that we could all put our heads together a little bit and think a little bit more about. We can do some more research and see what we could glean from other jurisdictions and have some other suggestions. Um, I think Commissioner Gill, not necessarily on this topic, but suggested we don't have to have it all perfect or correct for the public hearing draft, but so obviously we'll have more time to talk about and think about it after the public hearing process or through the public hearing process as well. So anyway, just, just my thoughts on that. I did wanna get back also to Commissioner Gill's comment or question, and, and Commissioner Gill, I do remember your comment about the um, moving the middle housing standards into the what would be essentially the residential standards section. I remember thinking that was a great idea at the time, and it's really just a formatting thing. Like you said, it might seem small, but I, I like the idea behind it, feeling like that's, that's the norm rather than the exception or the special thing that has to happen. So um, we haven't had a time 
to fully build or revise all the sections. So I've made, and I know I've noted it before and I'm keeping kind of an ongoing list of all the feedback we've gotten. And so I'm, I'm happy to change that formatting and do what you suggest for the public hearing draft. I think it's a good idea. And I, I think I do recall even um, talking, I think with Sandy about it at the time. And so um, happy to build that in unless I hear, you know, opposition from others for some reason that no, we shouldn't do that for the public hearing draft. And we could always change it back, but I think it makes sense. Thank you, Mark. I have Commissioner yes. Bergen with a very cute guest followed by myself. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to uh, speak in favor of Commissioner Gill's suggestion. Um, when I, as she was talking through it, I wanted I was put, trying to put myself in someone's shoes if they're looking through the code. And if I see that duplexes, triplexes, and whatever other units are in that special section, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I have other hoops or other fees that I have to pay. I'm not going to um, look into that even further. So even if it is just for a little bit um, better, a, a little bit better mental clarity for those that are um, interested in those other types, I think that would be beneficial. So I definitely speak in favor of that. Thank you, Commissioner Bergen. I echo those sentiments and thank you, Commissioner Gill for bringing that up again. Um, even just reading the section title of 4.7300-4.7400, it says special standards and regulations for certain uses and in residential districts and it's the same use, uh, they're houses in lower density areas. So um, appreciate that. And Mark, I'm also supportive of staff bringing back um, some suggestions for definitions for short-term rentals uh, language in upcoming work sessions. Are there any other thoughts from the commission on that? Anybody who's not supportive of that? Uh, maybe just a general like uh, temperature check. Okay. Looks like no uh, objections to that, Mark. If I could just ask, I don't mean to put Commissioner Quavula on the spot, but um, I wonder if if there's any specific thoughts, Commissioner, that you have on how we define short-term rental, if you think kind of this concept of somebody living in it and renting rooms versus standalone homes that are rented, that are vacant and rented. Um, in your mind, when you were thinking about including in a definition of short-term rental, did you have one or the other of those kind of concepts in mind at all? I guess just off the top of my head, Mark, I'd probably include both, but please use them uh, separately. But again, just to, to say that, you know, I think that it, it needs to be in the code just as a definition. I, I would definitely include them both. And we might be able to have like occupied short-term rentals versus non-occupied, I don't know. Again, I always think ahead to enforcement um, and properties change, you know, somebody might live in one for a while and then it changes and anyway. So we'll, we'll definitely explore that a little further and look into it and see what we can come up with. And we may not get it um, correct, but we'll try. Thank you, Mark and Commissioner Quivla, Commissioner Brigan. Thank you. Can I just um, quickly humor me? I don't have a specific stance on this, um, but playing devil's advocate, if you will, um, if there is a family, if yes, I'm going to say family, if there's a family that is not able, they're looking for a short term rental um, and there is there are two units, one that is just one bedroom available and then one that's in the entire house available and we're regulating them differently, um, would we be um, familial status is a protected class. Would we be discriminating against the larger family by regulating them separately? And I don't know the answer to that. I'm just thinking out loud here. If, like I said, if there's a unit that has one bedroom available for rent and the rest of the home is residentially, um, whether it's owner or tenant occupied, and then the other one that does typically sit vacant is the only one that they would be available to and they are regulated completely different even though they are the same structure. I, th I think it's a good question and because this whole the legislation is brand new I think I can propose that example to Christina Kraz she'll be back in a couple of days um, 
and work with her on that. I don't, I see Sandy pop up. I don't know if you have thoughts, Sandy, on that. Yeah, my thought is the only real distinction I think that we would be allowed to put in place between a house that's a, used as a short-term rental versus a house that's used as a residence is potentially with regard to parking. Um, because the state has said in some cases we can't require more parking um, than one, or in some cases no parking for ADUs, that if it's a residence, we wouldn't be able to require a parking space. Whereas if it was a short-term rental, not a residence, we could require more parking spaces. In my mind, that's the only physical difference between the two uses that would manifest on the ground. And so if you had a house that didn't have the parking that we said was necessary for a short-term rental, then potentially you would not be able to rent your house out as a short-term rental if you did not have sufficient on-site on parking, for example. I, I think one of the commissioners mentioned it too, and that is, is what are what's the problem we're solving for? And so, you know, are we trying to get out ahead of a problem that we envision might be someday, or um, you know, dis um, incentivizing these uses? So anyway, it's it's just something I keep in the back of my head about that. Thank you, Sandy and Mark, Commissioner Gill. And, and so for me, that loops around back to the idea and possible recommendation to consider incentives for the use of residential properties that provides housing opportunity. And so not using sticks for the things that are concerning about um, not having those units available for long-term rental or ownership um, but incentivizing those opportunities. So that might be a way to, to consider it as well. Thank you, Commissioner Gill. I'm not seeing any other hands, but I will wait just a second. Oh, Commissioner Bergen. Gosh, it sounds like I'm super passionate about this, doesn't it? <laughs> Just trying to think about things. Um, I am I correct that Airbnb's Verbo, whatever website they're utilizing, they um, have a hospitality tax. They have a, have to pay the transient tax. Um, same similar to hotels, or is that um, municipality specific? So I can answer that. I mean, per our regulations, yes, they are supposed to pay the transient room tax. Do we have a agreement with any of the um, online vendors to enforce that? No. I was just thinking when Commissioner Gill had talked about an incentive, um, this would be an incentive to not, I mean, if they're having to pay those some additional taxes or registration to be a host, which I, I know in some communities they have that that's why i wasn't sure if we if ours did so thank you for that clarification. yeah any any transient use um less than 30 days is supposed to pay the transient room tax if they're doing it on a commercial basis thank you sandy and commissioner bergen I'm not seeing other hands, so I will hand it over to Mark. Um, since tonight's just a work session, we don't have time for business from, or we don't have business from the Planning Commission on the agenda, but I will have one meeting reminder after Mark closes. So don't run away right when he closes, please. Yeah, and that, it was great tonight. I appreciate all the input and feedback. I did mention our next meeting in two weeks, and we will be trying to kind of put a big bow on all this stuff. I know it might not feel like we're ready to wrap it up, but um, again, I've shared the timeline with you. Um, we're trying to get the notices, the legal notices that we're required to send out to stay on track. Um, there, I envision a lot more conversation about some of the details and things through the public hearing process once we do release the public hearing drafts and hear from the community. And so we're putting in our, the next two and a half weeks for us, um, 
is very quick to try and finalize these public hearing drafts, but we definitely appreciate all your input. What I will kind of repeat is what I feel like I heard tonight specifically on the occupancy limits is that generally that I didn't hear really support for that. So I think what I'll do is for the public hearing draft on that piece is take that out. I will bring back for the next work session also what I can find in terms of what the building code regulates on occupancy. So we can consider that and then um, move forward from there. So again, that's all I have and I really appreciate all your help and thoughts and ideas. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I hope this is the last of the House bills and Senate bills for this project. We have 2001 and 2583 and, um, and well, Senate Bill 458. <laughs> unfortunately, it's not. And you'll see the comprehensive list probably tomorrow, maybe from the packet for the Joint City Council's Planning Commission meeting. I think there's six, seven, or eight. I can't remember. There's a number that we're also trying to figure out how to incorporate. So there's quite a few. Well, I commend staff for staying on top of it. Um, so as Mark mentioned, our next planning commission meeting is on November 16th. However, we do have a joint meeting next Monday, November 8th at 5.30 p.m. Um, a couple years ago, we had a joint meeting like this with the city council. It's just a check-in. It's great for them to see us um, since they appoint us um, and check in on some topics. Um, I believe that the um, agenda item summary will be sent out later this week. Um, there are four questions proposed um, that that just mirror what Mayor Van Gordon would like to talk about. So um, I'll share them now and then you'll get them in print, but just to get the wheels moving a little bit, um, it'll also be super informal. The first is just introductions um, and the icebreaker question is something you're proud of from this past year. Um, then after that, um, the council would like to talk about public meetings. Um, the staff will give a presentation on public outreach this past year, especially during COVID. Um, so the question is, what is something that you think went well and something that you'd like to see improve this coming year? Um, then, because we had the opportunity to pilot Springfield Oregon Speaks, um, there's a question asking commissioners to um, share their experience using Springfield Organ Speaks and then for counselors to ask any questions to us about our experience or share any concerns or hopes for them hopefully using it soon. And then uh, lastly, there's an opportunity to talk about the development code update. And so um, commissioners will be asked what our takeaway is from the first phase of the code rewrite and what questions we have for city council. And then city council will be able to share some of their policy decisions and recommendations. Um, so just a time for us to all get together. Um, are there any questions about that? It's Monday at 530. And Commissioner Landon, you asked a great question. I don't know if everybody was on during this between work sessions. It's not the same Zoom link. And so it will be a separate Zoom link that will be sent out. City Council has their meetings on Zoom webinars. Sandy, did I miss anything there? No, but the, the correct, I'm not sure if we'll have the Zoom link on the Springfield Oregon Speaks tomorrow, but it will be um, on the Springfield Oregon Speaks page for Monday night. So you'll be able to go to Springfield Oregon Speaks to get the Zoom link if you don't have your email handy. Great, thank you, Sandy. All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so with that, I close this work session. Oh, Commissioner Landon. Oh, when you're calling for minutes, uh, let me know. I'm sorry. Oh. Hey, I, I attended a city council meeting last evening. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Landon, since this is a work session, that's not on the agenda oh, okay. tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We will ask you uh, next time. Um, just keep those for a couple of weeks until um, November 16th. I think it's so weird for us to have a work session. Um, well, great. actually, I mean, the 16th is just a work session too. So if you wanted to have him share tonight, but um, you could, or we could make sure we add that item to your um, meeting next time. Um, I'm going to look, do a temperature check. It is past eight o'clock. Um, I know we don't have a limit, but okay. 
Commissioner Cuevo is saying no. Commissioner Landon, is it okay if you hold on to those till November 16th? And let's request staff to put that on the agenda. Yeah, we'll add that on the agenda. And then perhaps also add um, business from um, Planning Commission and staff just to for any updates that we might have. Sounds great. Good. Okay, with that, the meeting is over. I close the work session. See you all on Monday the 8th at 5.30 p.m. Good night.